I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and hotties. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Just fine, just fine. And the most wonderful thing has happened. To you? No, not to me exactly. It's really to a friend of mine. Well, what's his name? Hank Founds. And he has a new baby at his house. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Where'd he get it? At the hospital. Is that so? Yes. Mrs. Founds went to the hospital one night, and then the next day she came home with the baby. Well, why did she have to stay at the hospital overnight? To see if the baby liked them enough to want to go home with them. That's only fair to the baby, you know. Yes, it is. And did the baby like them? Oh, yes. She loved Mrs. Sam. And how about Hank? Oh, she loved him, too. Oh, that's wonderful. What's the baby's name? It's Lisa Dale, but she can't pronounce it yet. But she's so sweet. Well, that certainly is something wonderful. Yes. Now, can we read the funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. A series of crimes has occurred around the town of Buckskin. Hoppy has learned that they've been committed by a mysterious person who changes his disguise with every crime. This person is called by the citizens the chameleon. While investigating these crimes, Hoppy has been caught in the freight office standing over a dead man, holding a gun in his hand. He's been turned over to the Texas Rangers. Today, the leader of the Protective League in Buckskin, Mr. Grief, formed by the citizens of Buckskin, is talking to one of the men who is saying... Hey, with Cassidy under arrest and out of the way, perhaps a bit more uh, persuasion may force the Bar 20 and others to join our protective league, Mr. Grief. Mr. Grief replies, Well, that can wait. In the morning stage will be leaving with 40,000 in banknotes aboard. Couldn't wonder if the chameleon was aboard. Last picture, top row, Hoppy, with a group of rangers, is returning to Buckskin. The rangers have believed Hoppy's story, and they've worked out a scheme to work together to catch the chameleon. The leader of the rangers is saying, Now you still have time to back out, Cassidy. We can clear you of that fake ranger shooting and forget the plan. After all, it is pretty risky. Hoppy says, Now let's leave it the way it is. The leader goes on, first picture, next row. Now the Texas rangers need an outsider to pose as an outlaw, but it means deserting your friends. And another one adds, yeah, and giving up your good name and reputation till you nail the chameleon, or he nails you. That moment they come into town, they see the stagecoach is about to leave. Grief is getting into the coach. The ranger says to Hoppy, last picture, second row. All right, the stage is just pulling out. Chameleon or some of his henchmen could be among that crowd. Now's your chance, Cassidy. Make it look good. If the coach pulls out, suddenly Hoppy spurs topper forward. The rangers yell, Cassidy's escaping! Fire over Hoppy's head. Last picture down the road, Hoppy comes after the stagecoach with the rangers after him. The driver of the coach yells, Tight skate! Hold tight, Mr. Grief! Ooh, that's a dangerous scheme because maybe Mr. Grief or the driver of the stagecoach will shoot at Hoppy if he wants to get on the coach. Yes, and with all that money on that coach, Hoppy wants to make sure no one holds it up. Do you think the scheme will work? Well, we'll find that out next week. Now? Well, now, let's turn over the page to page three, because I know Prince Valiant will be there. Very well. Over the page we go. And you were right. Here's Prince Valiant. You remember? Uh, he gone off on a hunting trip with Arf last week, a young boy who's so smart. And they had trouble as they were crossing the flooded river. A tree crashed into them, knocking their horses over, and Val and Arf barely escaped with their lives. But their horses were killed dead, and the guard that was with them thought they were dead, too, and he's gone home. But Prince Val found Arf was safe, and so he built a fire so they wouldn't be cold during the night. I wonder what they'll do now. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant and the Days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. Dawn.
dawn comes clear and bright. Arf is all right, though still weak from his battle with the raging water. Prince Val says, Well, let's see how much of our gear the river's left us, for there are two score leagues between us and home. Below the cascade, they find the bodies of their animals and salvage a few things the river has not claimed. They find Val's bows and arrows, blankets, hatchet, and their hunting gear. Last picture top row, while their few possessions are drying, Val fixes Arf a fishing line, fashioning a lure from a clamshell with which Arf attracts some inquisitive trout within reach of Val's spear. One big trout comes close. Val sends his spear home and draws out of the river food for breakfast. Later in the day, first picture next row, well-fed and rested, they begin to climb to the higher ridges where traveling is easier. The long way home is going to be difficult for Val with his two good legs, but for one-legged arc, it will be impossible. The last picture, second row, Val leads the way back to the river. He says... Now, Arf, you may have the pleasure of skinning the horses and removing their bladders while I go into the pine-scented forest for work. We are going to build a boat. First picture bottom row, Val scours the nearby woods for the proper materials. Dry cedars, green saplings, strips of tough inner bark, roots for binding, balsam for glue. While Arf sets the bladders out to dry and cuts the waste bit of hide into thongs. When night falls, all the materials have been assembled and shaped. On the morrow, they will become boat builders, and they settle down around their campfire, preparing dinner with the happiness of two friends who are confident that they are equal to any problem that will face them. They do look happy there around the campfire making their supper. Yes, don't they? You know, no food tastes better than food cooked over a campfire after a hard day's work in the fresh air. Yes, that does give you an appetite, doesn't it? You bet it does. It makes you feel good, too. Val and Arf look like they feel so good that they aren't afraid anymore. I don't think they are, either. But we'll find out next week how they make out with their boat. Last week, Donald Duck came after Prince Valiant. Does he this week? Well, let's find out. Turn over the page. Go past Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger. Turn over that page... Go past little iodine, and there on page seven is Donald Duck. Oh, I'm so glad, Donald Duck. So here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squee, jump, squee, jump, squee, the chicka chack. Let's have music to better. Quack, quack. Donald's girlfriend, Daisy, is talking to him on the phone. Guess what? I'm remodeling my entire house. Donald hears this. He says to himself, Uh-oh. He's got work in mind for me. And he says into the phone, Well, Tut, what gives? Daisy answers, Oh, a spare bedroom and refacing with stone and brick. And uh, well, would you like to help by painting the den floor? Donald replies, Well, sure, if it won't take too long. I don't want to miss the big fight tonight, though. Oh, it's okay, Last picture, top row. Daisy opens the door. There stands Donald with paintbrush and paint in his hand. Okay, Doc. Let's get started. Oh, good. It's in the first room on the left. And in a moment, Donald's in the first room on the left, on his knees, painting the floor. Ah, he went right. I'll be out of here in 30 minutes. Half hour later, the floor is all painted, except for a little patch in front of the door. Ah, practically done. He opens the door and sees the door opens against a brick wall. The new brick wall Daisy had built when the new bedroom was made. Last picture, Daisy pops her head in the room and says, Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you about that door. Well, besides, it'll be dry in only 12 hours. Donald slides down and leans against the brick wall. He doesn't say a thing, but inside he feels just like this. (laughs) Oh, poor Donald. Why didn't he start at the other end of the room and 
taped to the door he came in, and then he could get out without being cornered in. Yes, but if he'd done that, it wouldn't have been a funny paper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now let's turn over the page. Oh, and, and then we're at the end of the first part. So pick up the second section then, and there on the first page of the second section is Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I just love that because that Dagwood does such silly things. Now let's find out what silly thing he's doing today. Ram a food, am a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood goes to the drugstore today, taking the pups along for a walk. As he comes into the drugstore, he sees a scale. Oh, I haven't weighed myself in a long time. I wonder what I weigh. He steps on the scale, but he's so busy looking at the needle, he doesn't see that three of the dogs are sitting on the scale with him. Last picture, top row, the needle stops. Great Scott, 210 pounds. I'm 50 pounds overweight. He tears out of the drugstore. First picture next row, he charges into the kitchen at home. Bloody! Bloody! No food for me tonight! None at all! He goes into the living room and lies down. Later, as they're eating their dinner, Cookie looks at Dagwood's empty chair and says, How can Daddy live if he doesn't eat? Blondie shakes her head and says, I'm terribly worried about Daddy. Alexander says thoughtfully as he gobbles half a loaf of bread. Uh, how long will a human body last without nourishment, Mom? Whereupon Blondie picks up her salad and goes into the living room. She says to Dagwood, lying on the sofa, Won't you even have salad and crackers? No, no, take it away, take it away. Not another bite of food until my weight's back to normal. <laughs> After Blondie has finished her dinner, she's still worried, so she goes into the living room with a cup of tea. Dagwood jumps out of the window, holds under the window sill. Blondie holds the tea out the window and says, Please, Dagwood, drink this tea to sustain life overnight. No, no, take it away. I'm never going to eat again. Never, never. A little later, Cookie says, I wonder how many pounds Daddy lost by not eating supper. Blondie says, Get the bathroom scales for me and we'll see. Cookie dashes into the bathroom, picks up the scale, dashes back into the living room. Sets the scale down. Dagwood steps on it, waits until the needle stops. Hey, I'm back to 160 pounds. Good heavens, you lost 50 pounds by not eating your supper. Whereupon Dagwood keels over on the floor. <laughs> Alexander and Blondie pick him up. Blondie says... Quick, into the kitchen. Daddy's wasting away to nothing. So they hurry into the kitchen with him. Alexander says... Uh, he'll be nothing but skin and bones. They set him at the table. They open the refrigerator. Get out the steak, macaroni, peas, liverwurst, gooseberries, goose pimples. And they start shoving them down Dagwood's throat. It's just quick. Uh, and this. Uh, and this. Uh, and this. Uh, Last picture, he's lying on the sofa again. Blondie, Cookie, Alexander, and the dogs looking at him. And Blondie says... The crisis is over. He'll live. And Dagwood sighs contentedly. Ah. Oh, will somebody please bring me a toothpick? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that Dagwood. He's so funny. Yes, nobody could lose 50 pounds in an hour. Now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Oh. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. yip yo Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. yip yo <laughs> Roy has come to Pauline Bunyan's logging camp at the request of her niece, Wildwood Dowd. Wildwood has told Roy that a series of strange accidents have been preventing Aunt Pauline from getting her lumber delivered to market on time. As they're talking, one of the men tells them that Cosmo, an old-timer who hates the loggers and who loves the forest, is up on the ledge where the timber is stacked. Roy gallops up the hill to stop Cosmo from doing any mischief. As he nears the top of the hill, Cosmo releases a stack of logs that come tumbling down toward Roy. Roy turns Trigger around, gallops down the hill, the logs hot on his heels. Run, Trigger! The old man can't loose the whole pile of logs! Down the hill, Roy comes, the logs close behind. He heads straight for an engine shed made of heavy logs. He gallops under the cover of the porch, yelling, 
Timber slide. Old Cosmo's on the rampage again. The logs thunder against the building and come over the top, knocking over the chimney and the furnace. Sparks set fire to the chips and slash. The engineer shouts last picture top row. Hey, it's time Pauline put a holder on that old loon who loves trees and hates loggers. Hey, lend a hand. The chips and slash caught on fire. Yeah, right. Here comes the Pauline Bunyan and Wild will help now. Meanwhile, second picture, bottom row. Old Cosmo, the man responsible for the trouble, is riding along on his mule, talking to her. <laughs> uh, see the beautiful trees, Farron? Uh, they'll know I'll protect him against the thieving timberman who chop him down. Suddenly, a lasso flips out from behind a tree, over Cosmo's head, pinning his arms to him, and jerks him off his mule. Hey, 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 what's here? Cosmo looks up, and he sees a burly man at the end of the rope. Hey. Uh, Ed Sneed, a timber cruiser. Stay away from me. Ah, shut up, you old fool. I won't hurt you. I kind of like the idea of blaming you for all these accidents. Leaves me in the clear. Last picture, Cosmo says, uh, you, you mean you ain't going to turn me in, Etch? Not if you do as I say, old Cosmo. I want that cowboy who's investigating the accidents for Pauline destroyed. But we do it my way, savvy. <laughs> I was so afraid Roy wasn't ever going to get away from those logs in time. Yes, it was a lucky break that no one was killed. But it was too bad that the building was set on fire. Yes, it was. I wonder what that scheme is that that man named Sneed wants old Cosmo to work with him on. He says he wants to destroy Roy. Well, he's up to no good, but we'll find out more about this next week. Now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, here's Flash Gordon. And you remember, he's on the planet Mars where he was a prisoner of Queen Menta, a very bad, cruel, mean woman. And Menta came to a bad end because of her cruelty. She was pulled beneath the waters and killed by a whip shock during the Great Flood. Yes, and then Flash and Dale and Link and the pile of the rocket ship, they're safe for a while anyway. Yes, and they're standing on a pile in the midst of the flood, and they see a rocket ship coming toward them. And I wonder if the rocket ship will be friends or enemies. Let's find out right now. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega, rega, doon, doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. As the Martian Canal plane alights alongside the castaways, Queen Menta's pilot calls out. Hey, beware of these earth people, Prince Savvy. They stood idly by while your sister drowned. But the new ruler of Mars makes no hostile move. He says... I was thought talking with Menta till the end. Flash and his friends are taken aboard the ship. And they head for Prince Savvy's palace. Prince Savvy says to Flash, The accident was Menta's fault. I've always opposed her mad scheme to conquer the Earth. Flash is happy to find that Prince Savvy is friendly and he eagerly begins to talk to him about a treaty of interplanetary friendship of the people of Mars and the Earth with them as leaders. Prince Savvy is completely cooperative, and it looks as though Flash has met a man who has the same good wishes for all good people as Flash does. Last picture top row, at Prince Savvy's castle, Flash immediately begins work with the leading Martian scientists thought recording the most useful non-military inventions of the two planets' civilizations. Flash is elated by the surprising turn of events. He knows that the Earth will benefit greatly by this unity with Mars. And then, first picture bottom row, their labor's finished. Prince Savvy gives Flash his fastest space rocket to return to Earth with a Martian envoy and a group of scientists. Link, remaining on Mars as Earth's temporary ambassador, waves a lonely farewell. The great ship speeds serenely through the trackless heavens. To pass the time, Flash tunes in on the space scanner, and he gasps at what he sees. Good Lord! He exclaims, something's terribly wrong. Last picture, Dale and the Martian envoy hurry to his side. Flash points to the scanner screen, saying, Look at that Earth image. Why, it's incredible. Solid ice over most of North America and Europe. Oh, isn't that terrible? The Earth's covered with ice. What can that mean? What can that 
that mean? Well, I'm certain it means more than it's a cold winter. This is something very mysterious. Why, this can be like years ago when icebergs came down from the North Pole. Oh, I hope that isn't what he finds. Well, we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. Now it's time, though, for Dick's Adventures, and today we'll find Dick on the very last page. So just turn over now to the very last page, and here he is. Remember, Dick is in the early days of America on an exploring expedition into the Wild West. Yes, and they have reached the Rocky Mountains, where the Missouri River on which they've been traveling begins. Yes, it begins at a waterfall, and now they can't travel by boat. They'll have to carry everything around the waterfall. Yes, and in front of them are mountains and forests, almost so thick you can hardly get through, but they have to go on ahead. How will they ever do it? Well, let's read now and see. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a That's some music, music for adventurous Dick. Dick. At the spot which is now Great Falls, Montana, the Lewis and Clark expedition is stopped dead by 16 miles of Missouri River rapids and whirlpools. Dick muses, hey, we've got to navigate our boats over dry land, but how are we going to get out of this little fix? Crude wagons are made by cutting down thick trees, then slicing through the trees, platters of wood a foot thick. These are used for wheels, and when the wagons have been made, the boats are loaded on them. And the men make horses of themselves and pull the crude wagons up the mountainside, forward by aching inches. The work is hard. As the men stop to rest, completely exhausted, Dick, who is looking at the boat, feels the wind against his cheek. Second row, Dick suddenly says, Hey, the boat's on wheels and a strong wind blowing. Hey, I think I got something. Quickly, he tells Lewis and Clark of his idea. And in a short time, a mast and sails have been put on the boats. The men think the idea is crazy. And then second picture, bottom row, an unbelievable thing happens. The wind fills the huge sails. And with the men pulling, the crude wagons begin to move over an incredible sea of rocks and trees. Last picture, in a narrow high-walled gully, dry under the summer sun, the flotilla winds upward. Dick says, only one more mile to go. And then suddenly the wind dies. The air turns freezing cold, and ominously the sky blackens. Oh, weren't they lucky to have Dick along? Yes. Those poor men would have been all worn out pulling those boats up the mountain. Not only that, but it would have taken them months moving an inch at a time. But now if the wind has died down, how will they go the other mile that is left? Well, we'll find that out next week. Now look underneath Dick's adventures. Oh, Rusty Riley. And, and this is so mysterious because Rusty has trailed the thieves who stole the trophies from Mr. Miles' safe. He's trailed them to the old, old spooky house. Yes, and Rusty and Pete have slipped into the house and are searching for the place where the valuables are hidden. But a terrible thing happened. One of the crooks is still there, and he's found the car that Rusty and Pete came in. Oh, I hope he doesn't catch Rusty and Pete because he's cruel. Well, let's read now and see what happens with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty and Pete move cautiously around the spooky house. Rusty exclaims, Cheapers, what a tumble-down mess this place is. He must have been empty for years. Pete replies, Yeah, wherever they hid those trophies, they can't be far. They were in here only a few minutes. You know, I got a hunch they had a hiding place all picked out beforehand. Hey, watch your step, Rusty. Look out for broken floorboards. Yeah, yeah. Rusty replies, You know, I kind of think they did too. Hey, wait. And he sees last picture top row. Say, I'll bet you that under one of these loose floorboards that make a swell hiding place. Hey, by Jiminy, Rusty, you're right. Hey, come on, let's start looking. go through a door, down some steps to a room below. Rusty says, 
We've looked everywhere in the upper floors. Now for the basement. Yeah. I thought sure we'd find the trophies up there. In the dim light of the cellar, they move around. Suddenly, Pete exclaims, Oh, boy, we're on the right track now. Look, Rusty, fresh earth. Somebody's been digging here. Yeah, and here's the shovel. And they begin to dig. And then Rusty's shovel strikes something. Pete drops to his knees and draws the earth back with his hands. And then exclaims, Hey, we hit the jackpot, Rusty. Here's the stuff. Suddenly, Rusty whispers, Hey, hold it, Pete. I think I heard somebody upstairs. Listen. With the sound of a door slam, Rusty runs up the stairs and tries the knob. He exclaims, Hey, gosh, Pete, they bolted this door from the other side. We're trapped. Oh, I was afraid of that. That man knob found them in the house and... And he just knew they, what they were doing, and he caught them. Now what'll happen? They're all locked up. I don't know. And what makes it worse is that the detective has told Mr. Miles that Rusty and Pete were the ones who stole the trophies. This is terrible. And the detectives are looking around everywhere for them. Oh, wouldn't it be awful if they found them in the basement? Yes, because with the trophies down there in the basement... And Rusty and Pete there? Why, it would look as though Rusty and Pete had come there to hide them. And I'm sure that that's what Nobbs would tell the detective, and they might believe them. But then again, I'm sure Tex will find a way to straighten things out. Oh, I certainly hope so. Well, we'll find out that out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Honey and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Bigly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend Miss Honey next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man. Thank you.